Now, but I want to ask about, so I want to take this and try to put it into context of early Islamic history, which is usually what is done. Um, and, you know, even certain studies that have been on carbon dating um, are pretty quick to then um, compare their results with the traditional narrative or with the traditional narratives um, of the codification of the Quran, which, you know, as many of our viewers will know, uh, the traditional report is that there was one, um, uh, there's, there's certain stories which involve Abu Bakr, the first caliph reigns from 632 to 634, bringing together the Quran on writing, on suhuf, on individual sheets. Uh, but the principal uh, work to bring the Quran together into one mushaf, one codex, is that of Uthman, the third caliph, um, who reigns from um, from 644 to 656, at least according to traditional dates. Now, okay, so I want to assess this claim, the Uthman claim, and bring in some other evidence that you raise in the book, Reading the Quran, um, because, uh, I mean, it, it there could be other arguments for Uthman. Now, you've already mentioned the beginning, the first two chapters, you deal with some of the traditional arguments that the Islamic sources attribute this to Uthman, therefore it is likely by Uthman. Um, at least one argument um, that you address is the uniformity of the uh, of the Quranic text, at least with the exception of the Sena Palimpsest. The basic Quranic Continental text is remarkably uniform across the manuscripts. So, mm -hmm. I mean, doesn't that make it likely that there would be the project of one caliph who destroyed variant versions, just like we read about in the stories about Uthman? Yes, I think that's true. But that caliph was not Uthman, the caliph of Abdul Malik. What are some of the points that would lead us to Abdul Malik and away from Uthman? Well, I mean, to really answer that question, it takes, you know, quite Some a bit of, <laughs> what's that? It was a few more episodes. Well, or a book, um, you know, and to get really the full answer, I'd look at the first two chapters of the book uh, where it's laid out in some painstaking detail. I mean, the truth of the matter is this attribution to Uthman is not uniform. There are all kinds of other people the first Quran is attributed to. Uh, the story of Uthman as we have it is really a creation of Bukhari. Um, who canonizes it, and he places it in, you know, a Hadith collection, which gives it a kind of religious authority, uh, at least for Sunnis, uh, and then it becomes the received narrative, and all of these other ones are just left to the side. Now, speaking of Sunnis, one of the things I highlight in my book, building on the exceptional work of our, our good friend, mutually, I think, uh, Ali uh, Amir Mouezi, uh, he has done the excellent work of showing us actually the early Shi is a very, very, very different story to tell about the early history of the Quran. And it's one that's, I think, not only neglected, but it's disparaged often. And I mean, if you go look at Noldike and that big, massive volume, it's just the, the Shi'is are lumped in with the Christian polemicists in terms of the worth of their views on the formation of the Quran. It's unacceptable. Uh, really, it's unacceptable. We need to do better than that. Uh, so... Um, there's a there's a lot of noise uh, around who was the first person to collect the Quran. We look outside of the Hadith collections. We look to the historians, uh, which I do in the book. Following up, and here's another name everyone should know: the great work of Alfred de Primar. Uh, one of my big beefs with scholarship on the Quran in North America and Germany is they are not reading French scholarship. Go, I, just go look at a random bibliography and see how much. Uh, French, see how much Guillaume D is in there, right? See how much De Primar is in there. See how much Gilio is in there. Um, they're not reading these scholars, and I think that some of the best scholarship out there. So, and De Primar, I think, was the greatest scholar of the Quran uh, in the 20th century. Uh, and he, I, a lot of the information I'm taking there is from having read his studies, where he goes through the early historians and says, well, let's, let's look aside from, you know, uh, sources about the Quran, sources uh, about Hadith. Let's look at what the early historians are saying. You know, sometimes they don't mention anything about Uthman having anything to do with the Quran. How is that possible if it's like well known that, to everyone that Uthman did this? Uh, another issue uh, we were talking a little bit about this before. Could Uthman have even possibly done this? Did he have a state apparatus? This is a point. You know, I'm doing a lot of name dropping here, but hey. A lot of what I've done is not my own stuff. I'm building on the work of a lot of other colleagues who've done exceptional work uh, in trying to do critical 
recent, yourself included, I might add. Boy, don't let me forget to say that. Um, you know, to sort of build up an, uh, a critical account of the Quran. Um, Guillaume D has some excellent stuff in French in his Quran des Historiens uh, about what it takes to canonize a text. It takes to make a text standard across an entire empire. It takes a pretty impressive state apparatus that can so enforce your, that. Your contention is that that state apparatus did not exist in the time of Uthman, but did exist in the time of Abdel Malik. Um, my sense is that is a very widespread consensus among scholars studying the emergence of the early Islamic state. Mm -hmm. There is some uh, some thought that maybe around Muawiyah something is starting to come into view. Uh, but if there is, there's nothing like what we see with Abdel Malik. That is when we are really have a very powerful state, a state that could do something like mm -hmm. enforce a canonical Quran. And we have accounts of them doing this. We we even have an account that tells us how much they compensated someone when they stole their Quran and, and confiscated it and destroyed it. Um, but this is another thing with why I think we need to give a lot more credibility to the account of Abdul Malik. Uh, there is a very widespread account that Abdul Malik uh, and his functionaries did a lot to edit the Quran. Mm -hmm. This is not up, really up for any debate. That mm -hmm. is in the tradition. Question is, what did they do? Right? Well, so those who say, oh, well, the Quran was already in place. Oh, well, he added a couple diacritical marks. Mm -hmm. Oh, mm -hmm. you know, maybe there were some vowels put in. So you're referring to the work of Hajaj and the so-called second Masahif project. Correct. That exactly. Mm -hmm. um, so this is pretty universally attested, although second, I might dispute um right uh a couple points with this one is this is confirmed in the external sources some of which are near contemporary with this activity and what these these christian sources admittedly are telling us is that this is when the quran was standardized so that you know think what you will about external sources but it's significant that we have a convergence of what's coming out of the Islamic tradition, what's coming in other traditions there. And then there's also um, the work, I'm forgetting, uh, the great French manuscript specialist. De Roche. De Roche. Um, he says this can't be what's going on uh, with this project of Al-Hajaz and, and, and Abdel Malik because actually the manuscripts aren't consistent with that assumption that that's what's happened because we see some of those things before that time in the manuscript we see some of those things after that time in the manuscript so mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i think if you're what you're looking for is what there's a consensus on then it's not done okay okay 